leather, baby, then you was doing something, man, and had reached that point of maturity where, where you can smell like daddy smelled, and, and you can wear what daddy wore, and, and you can go and get your hair cut at the Bible. You had moved from boyhood into this place of manhood. And, but then some other folks say that, you know, when you start to get a little bass in your voice, that's, that's when you become a man. But I found out that just because you got bass in your voice don't mean that you're a man. That means that that just gives your mama license to punch you in the throat. Every time you decide that you're going to act crazy and use that bass in your voice and talk to your mama any old kind of way, that just gives her license to do what she needs to do to put a little highness back in that voice that think it's a man and some folks say that it don't matter how big you get and how much stuff you acquire that you will not ever be considered a man as long as you live in mama or grandmama's basement yeah as long as you open up the refrigerator and put notes on your orange juice telling folk not to drink your orange juice and as long as behind your dough you got three boxes of captain crunch so don't nobody touch your cereal but you a grown man living in your mama's basement some folks say that's not a man you see in most cultures around the world there is a definitive point a transformative moment a rite of passage that signals to the world that my son or my grandson or my nephew has moved from boyhood into manhood now, for us, that may mean graduating from high school or graduating from college, or that may mean buying your first car, or that may mean moving out on your own and receiving your first electric bill and your first cable bill and your first gas bill and your first rent notice and your first grocery bill because that's when I realized that I was no longer a child sister Walton when the bill started coming in and they didn't say Aaron and Dolores Miller they said Amon Miller and then I thought I got married and I was going to be happy and split the bills with somebody else but that really wasn't no good because I had my bills and she had her bills and we came together and made bills together some folks say that manhood is signaled, unfortunately, by the number of girls that you sleep with. Or the number of babies' mamas and babies' mamas' mamas and babies' mamas' mamas that you have accumulated as you decided to sow your royal oats. And I want to tell you that just because you got the equipment don't qualify you for the job. Anybody can lay down, but... Can you take care of that child? Can you take care of that woman that you decided to get with? And instead of just calling her baby's mama and running from the child support folks, getting jobs where they pay you under the table so you don't have to pay child support for the four, five, and six babies that you have birthed in this earth. Somebody say the test of a man. But I want you to understand that in America, we seem to have it easy when it comes to rites of passage. Could you imagine living in Australia or Africa, men? And I'm talking to the men just for a second. Ladies, you can listen in. But I need the men to listen to me for one second. Could you imagine living in Africa or Australia and on your 14th birthday, they took you out to the bush and told you, don't take nothing for your journey. Just come on, put your loincloth on, let's go. And when you get out into the desert and to the wilderness, they tell you to lay down. And we're going to sing you a song for about an hour. We're going to chant and we're going to sing these songs. And in about an hour, we're going to take a sharp rock. And we're going to take off your loincloth. And we're going to circumcise you right here on this rock. We're not going to give you no anesthetic. Uh, you're not going to be in an operating room. You're not going to have a nurse holding your hand and counting down as the anesthesia causes you to go to sleep. But you're just going to lay here like a man and take the pain of this sharp rock circumcising you. Because only a man can lay there and endure pain. A child will cry out, but a man can take that pain. Do I got any men here that can say that they really could deal with that? Listen, I don't know about you. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I love the motherland of Africa. Thank God for the green patches, that could, the pouches at the offering. We can give the Africa, but brother's not trying to go back and get circumcised. As no rite of passage. I'll stay a boy forever if that what it takes. But they believe that only a man 
could endure that because a man is not going to cry. A man is not going to feel pain. A man is not going to express emotion. A man is not going to be caught up in the trials and the tests of this world. He is just going to take it. But the problem with that is, and my wife will tell you, that many times we hold these things in. And because we hold these things in, we become like a two liter of Coca-Cola that's been shaken up, waiting for somebody to just easily crack the top and blow up because we have lost our minds trying to be a man. As we look at our text, we see that the writer here in the 112th number of Psalms paints a picture of the righteous man. The man who does all the right things, who says all the right things, only goes to the right places and only hangs out with the right folks. And just as Psalm 112 gives us a snapshot of the life of righteous of a righteous man, the preceding Psalm 111 paints the picture of a righteous God. And he do, they do this for a reason, because as men, as women, especially as men, we must understand that we alone are not righteous. Our righteousness is only made through Jesus Christ and by permission from the Father. The Holy Ghost draws us in. Jesus died that we could have it and God said it's okay. But you by yourself, my brother, you're not righteous. I don't care how good you look. I don't care how much money you make on your job. I don't care what kind of car you drive and how big your five bedroom, three bath home is. By yourself, you're nothing. But I want us to key in on a couple verses in this psalm. Verses 1, 7, and 8. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation for your hearing, and it might read a little different than the translation you have, but I read this because I love the way they outline the text here. And in verse 1 it says, Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord. Yes, happy are those who delight in doing what he commands. They do not fear bad news, and they confidently trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless, and can face their foes triumphantly. Now, it is important to note that these verses point out the lifestyle of a righteous man, but the remainder of the verses in this text point out the outcome of righteous living. Let me say that again. These verses point out the lifestyle, the condition, what you need to do, the if. But then the rest of it points out, if you do these things, then this will be your blessing. Your house will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. You won't have lack. You will only have financial gain. Everywhere you go, people will talk good of you. You will be a lender and not a borrower. The enemy will try to attack you, but you will stand up against him if you do these things. Now, when we look at this text, it's very clear that a a, a man cannot reasonably expect to live a life full of blessings if that man does not also do what's required to receive the blessings. We live in the type of society where we want everything to come quick. We don't want to work for anything. We don't want to toil for anything. We don't want to tarry for anything. We just want somebody to hand it to us on a platter. And I'm not uh, I'm not any different than anybody else, Dr. Walton. I sometimes just want somebody to give me something. But I found out a long time ago, when I used to ask my daddy for stuff, he said, no, have you taken out the garbage? No, sir, I did not. He said, well, did you clean up your room? No, sir, I did not. He said, then you can't go on the trip that the rest of the youth group is going on because you have not handled your responsibilities. And let me paint a better picture for you as it turns of a man teaching a boy about responsibility. I used to get $5 a week allowance. And from that $5 a week allowance, my daddy would take $1.50 and save it just in case I needed it for a rainy day. He said, I'm going to take this $1.50 and I'm going to hold it for you because later on you may want to do something and you may not have accumulated enough money to do what you want to do. And on top of that, he then took 50 50 cent, which was 10% of the $5 and said, that is your tithe. So I started out with $5. He took $1.50 and saved it, took another 50 cent from it, and I was left with a measly $3. 
But now that I'm 37 years old, when I get my check, I take 10% out. <laughs> 